blowback is on our face. We have today. more drugs today than we did Massacre 10 years ago. Massacre at the Rome Airport. The unintended consequences are a thing. Stinger missile. Again, have terror blowback or a boomerang. The unintended effect. consequences are enormous. The CIA's secret warriors helped America win the Cold War. But their victories had a price which no one expected to pay. The unintended consequences from secret operations have come home to haunt the agency. I didn't give a shit about the unintended consequences. The President of the United States told him to get rid of that government. For almost a half century, the Central Intelligence Agency was the invisible hand of American power. It overthrew governments, created secret armies, consorted with drug lords, and hired assassins. My philosophy get the weapons into the hands of the shooters and really let God sort it out. If you want to terrorize the world, you need the CIA. I said, I want you to tell Abu Abbas that I'm coming after him. And when I get to him, I'm going to kill him. The fallout from 50 years of covert operations has damaged the reputation and credibility of the United States and steadily eroded America's faith. The CIA. How are we supposed to trust the CIA official to investigate themselves? There is a word in the agency for fallout from a secret mission, blowback. Blowback hit home for many Americans in 1979. 53 hostages were seized in the U.S. Embassy in Tehran by supporters of the anti-American Ayatollah Khomeini. The CIA, under President Carter and his director Stansfield Turner, was caught by surprise by the hostage crisis. The hostage crisis in Iran was a turning point in our attitude towards terrorism. It was because it may have been one of the first times we realized as a country that a superpower could be so vulnerable. For 444 days, America was held hostage with the captives. Three of the prisoners were CIA officers. The agency had once managed Iran's mobs. Now, the CIA was at the mob's mercy. In 1953, a handful of CIA officers carried out the agency's first successful coup. They hired Iranian gangs to block Premier Mossadegh's plan to take over Western oil companies. There are a lot of Iranians who now say that it was a great mistake to get rid of Mossadegh and put the Shah back on there because if Mossadegh had stopped, you never would have had Khomeini. Well, hell, I don't know whether he would have or not. But the pressure in those days was to get rid of that son of a bitch who had nationalized the Anglo-Iranian oil company. Selfish, greedy, if you like, overweening, powers that were exerted on little people. All of these things, they, maybe they stink to high heaven. The CIA restored the pro-American Shah to his peacock throne. And for the next 25 years, it helped to keep him there. With the CIA's aid, the Shah built a repressive secret police force, Savak, which tortured and murdered thousands of Iranians. Rage against America for the CIA actions simmered in the streets of Tehran. In 1979, the Ayatollah Khomeini led an Islamic revolution which overthrew the Shah. His supporters stated the takeover of the U.S. Embassy was payback time. I don't believe that we in the CIA at that time understood the culture of Iran well enough. That is, that there was this substantial clerical movement that was growing in importance. Khomeini sparked a jihad, a holy war, against the great Satan, America. Blowback hit again in 1983. Iranian-backed Shiites bombed the U.S. Embassy in Beirut, the CIA headquarters in Lebanon. The chief of station in our station in Beirut 
before he accepted the assignment, was at dinner with me and asked me what I thought. And I had to say to him, he said, you know, you could get killed. It's a dangerous job. Um, if you don't, you'll come home having said it was the best job you ever had. The embassy blast killed 63 people. Among them were nine CIA employees, including Anderson's friend, the chief of station. It was a horrible day uh, to have to replay that conversation when I realized that it had happened. The agency was up against a new kind of enemy, difficult to locate, much less destroy. Finding an effective response was a dilemma. Violent retaliation might provoke still more blowback. Recruiting agents to infiltrate terrorist cells could also cause problems. We had an individual who was just about inside a terrorist organization when they said to him, you must go out and murder so-and-so in order to prove to us that you're really part of us. They came to me and said, do we let him do this and have this payoff of inside information or not? And I said, absolutely not. The CIA's options were limited. It could not legally use the same tactics as terrorists. Iran was not the only problem. Libya's Muammar Gaddafi was the godfather of Middle East terrorism. The CIA found out just how hard it could be to thwart him. We did at one point manage to get a microphone, a listening device, uh, into a safe site in which a group of terrorists paid for by the Libyans were planning um, terrorist operations against international civil aviation. Um, the microphone just happened to be a lot closer to a refrigerator than it was to the conversations, uh, which left us in a position of frustratingly knowing that they were planning attacks on aircraft knowing that it was probably going to happen someplace, but we never knew where, we never knew when, until the day that we all came to work faced with the fact that this one had got by us. They did it. For over a decade, Gaddafi's men were behind a series of atrocities, from the 1973 Rome airport attack to the 1985 Christmas season massacre that murdered 19 people in the Rome and Vienna airports. President Ronald Reagan and CIA Director William Casey decided it was time to revamp the agency's approach to dealing with terrorism. I want to see Casey, and Casey said, the president's really got the heat on me about the DO or the CIA doing better on the terrorist problem. And I said, well, I've got some ideas. And he said, well, look, take a couple months off, the usual one, take a couple months off, and, uh, and put together a plan. Casey and Claridge shook up the CIA bureaucracy by creating a counterterrorism center. The new plan was a bureaucratic reshuffle and a more aggressive stance. Casey had in various po policy councils argued for a very proactive anti-terrorist program, including the uh, snatching or kidnapping of terrorists. Counterterrorism, you're either on the offensive, which is the only way to go, because you, you'll never build your walls high enough or put enough barbed wire up or electronics devices to ever protect yourself from these people. You gotta go get them. In 1986, based on information provided by U.S. intelligence, American warplanes bombed Tripoli and hit Gaddafi's residence in retaliation for a terrorist attack on a German discotheque. Pilots of the air and naval forces of the United States spoke to the outlaw Libyan regime in the only language that Colonel Gaddafi seems to understand. Libya claimed that 37 civilians were killed, including Gaddafi's stepdaughter. But Gaddafi survived. In the mindset of the Middle East, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, this would have been seen and was seen by the Libyan government as a, uh, as a blood debt to be settled. The blowback came two years later. In December of 1988, Pan Am Flight 103 exploded over Lockerbie, Scotland. Gaddafi's revenge killed 270 people.
At the time, I supported retaliation, but seeing what the consequences of that bombing were, I would have opposed it at this point, and I opposed those kinds of, of violent acts of retaliation because ultimately they don't work, and ultimately they do have unintended consequences. Uh, blowback. Fighting terrorists offer the CIA a chance to regain popular support after years of disdain, but it also required using tactics that could blow up in the agency's face. In the early 80s, to help contain Khomeini's Shiite terrorists, the U.S. turned to an unlikely ally, the Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein. If you're going to work the terrorist problem, you're going to have to deal with unsavory people. I mean, terrorism raises the question of dealing with people you wouldn't necessarily want as a member of your family. You wouldn't want your daughter marrying one of these people. Very often, they're that kind of person, okay? Scumbags. In 1980, Saddam Hussein started a long, bloody war with Iran. President Reagan and Director Casey set up a secret deal to assist Saddam. The CIA gave him critical intelligence to help his regime fight the war. In return, they expected him to stop harboring international terrorists. The thought was that maybe go over and talk to Saddam Hussein about giving us Abu Abbas, because he really owed us some. So I went over there, and we were met by the fellow by the name of Fadl Barak, pistol at his side, and I began to explain what I want. Well, I mean to say, I mean, he was speechless. I mean, I, I mean, his eyes rolled around his head, and he didn't know what to say, and, you know, I was out of my mind. I, clearly, I was a lunatic. Claridge asked Saddam's intelligence chief to turn over Abu Abbas, the terrorist responsible for the hijacking of an Italian cruise ship, the Achille Laro. His men had taken a wheelchair-bound Jewish-American passenger, Leon Klinghoffer, and thrown him into the Mediterranean. Yeah, I, you know, I didn't give this thing much chance anyways, okay? So I said, hey, uh, Fadl, I'll tell you something. I want you to tell Abu Abbas that I'm coming after him, and when I get to him, I'm going to kill him. For the first time in the whole day, Fadl smiled, because I'd finally said something he could compute. Saddam Hussein never gave the United States Abu Abbas. But the Iraqi leader overestimated U.S. tolerance and in 1990 invaded Kuwait. Saddam lost the Gulf War, but his regime survived. The CIA, which only a few years earlier had assisted him, has since supported repeated attempts by dissident Iraqis to remove him from power. I don't quite know how to phrase this because I would hate to sound cruel and, and that sort of thing, but uh, with all the Kurds being killed and the rough situation in Iraq, I just can't help wonder why we haven't killed Saddam Hussein yet. If uh, we could get him out of the picture, the Let, let me say that uh, we, we have a, a, a law in this country, I don't know when it was passed, <laughs> against assassination of foreign... The agency, which had launched assassination plots against at least nine foreign leaders, only stopped the tactic when Congress passed a law against it in 1975. Not only ethics were at issue. There's no public official in the world any more vulnerable than the President of the United States. And if the United States gets into the assassination business, we're going to lose a president very fast. The threat to U.S. officials hit home in January 1993, when a terrorist gunman opened fire on agency employees as they sat in their cars at an intersection outside CIA headquarters. The attack left two dead and three seriously wounded. The accused killer, who escaped and is still at large, was a veteran of the Holy War in Afghanistan. Blowback from one of the agency's greatest victories had struck at their front gate. Unfortunately, there was more to come. Watch out, watch out. The bombing of New York's World Trade Center in 1993 stunned the nation. Foreign terrorism had come ashore. America was no longer immune. The plotters came from a group of Islamic fundamentalists. The mastermind was a veteran of the CIA-supported Mujahideen, the holy warriors of Afghanistan. 
the entire American public was all in favor of supporting the Afghanis against the Russians. Now, the unintended consequences is that country's an absolute mess. It's torn apart. All these weapons are sitting around there shooting at each other. And they were all provided by the United States government. Afghanistan had been the final battleground of the Cold War. The CIA helped the Mujahideen rebels defeat the Soviet Red Army. To help the Afghanis, the CIA had set up training camps in neighboring Pakistan. CIA officers taught young Muslim men everything from making bombs to shooting down helicopters. They were carrying out a secret directive from President Reagan. The lethal finding said provide assistance, lethal and otherwise, to the people of Afghanistan to resist the Soviet in invasion. It didn't say anything about, at the end of this, make sure nice guys are in charge. Though orders to support the Afghanis had come directly from President Reagan, it was the CIA's job to decide which of the many rebel factions should get the most money and weapons. The CIA chose Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, a fundamentalist who hated the West. His followers had first attracted attention when they threw acid in the face of Muslim women who failed to wear the Orthodox veil. If you're going to take me in the middle of a jihad, a holy war, with 200,000 part-time soldiers of God and instruct me to come up with some sort of a litmus test to find out who's a nice guy, I mean, it can't be done. Hekmatyar's army had been accused of killing as many rival Afghanis as Soviet soldiers. What's it like sitting in a room staring at Hekmatyar? Uh, what you're staring at is a guy who says, you can almost read it, um, I have my purposes, you have yours. The military mastermind of the Mujahideen victory was Ahmad Shah Massoud. But the CIA and their Pakistani allies gave him less support because they considered him too independent. Uh, the که از سیایی زیاد شنیده بودیم عجیب معلوم میشه و ای تو فکر میکردیم که سیایی در همه جای شاید دوزور داشته باشه و از همه مسائل شاید واقف باشه Despite repeated warnings, the CIA made alliances with the most radical anti-Western forces My philosophy, and one that I think prevailed, get the weapons into the hands of the shooters and really let God sort it out The differences among the Afghanis were ignored because fighting the Soviets was all that mattered. It was a holy war for both the Mujahideen and the CIA. The only common ground was Islam, and the more fundamentalist, the more committed, the more willing they were to go into Afghanistan and shoot Russians. That's the goal. The CIA didn't fully appreciate how its holy warriors were being indoctrinated by their religious leaders. Fundamentalist clerics were not just exhorting their followers to fight against the Soviets. They were also preparing them for the next holy war against the United States. The CIA had helped the Afghanis defeat the Soviets. But in the mosques, the agency was often characterized as the invisible hand of the great Satan America. In the Afghan dictionary, you're going to find gratitude after gimme and gotcha. But uh, more important, we both have a strategic goal. We both want to defeat the Red Army. It's being done with our gold and their blood. During the nine-year war with the Soviets, one and a half million Afghanis were killed and half a million were maimed or wounded. The war's legacy of destruction has poisoned the feelings of many Afghanis about their former U.S. allies. For many of these orphans, war is the only life they have ever known. Their fathers were trained to fight and they killed 
to, to, to destroy. Their kids are left alone. I mean, they're they, with no education, with nothing. No one, is paying, no one is paying attention to them. So again, it's up to the West, whatever they wanted them to become. If they wanted them to become terrorists, so they should leave them alone and they would become a terrorist. If they wanted drug dealers, they would become drug dealers. I mean, fundamentalists, they would become a fundamentalist if they're left alone. The latest incarnation of fanaticism that has risen from the ruins of Afghanistan is the Taliban. In 1996, this faction took over much of the country, including the capital of Kabul. Under their strict Islamic rules, women were thrown out of work and schools, and all TVs, films, and radios were destroyed to get rid of Western influences. There is another seed which has flourished in the wake of war. Afghanistan has become a principal source of opium for the world. Some of the Mujahideen commanders who were supported by the CIA still control many of the area's huge poppy fields. The warring factions in Afghanistan have enough drug money, guerrilla training, and sophisticated weapons to destabilize the region and spread terrorism around the world. Included in their arsenals are the remaining Stinger missiles supplied by the CIA. For those in the agency who managed the Afghan campaign, the victory over the Soviets far outweighed any blowback that has followed. There isn't an inclination in America to say, hey, that was pretty good. There is an inclination to say, well, you know, you guys didn't consider the unintended consequences that giving weapons to uh, radical, wacko fundamentalists will cause trouble later. Well, this is the same kind of thinking that would have prevented us from uh, providing any assistance to the Soviet Union uh, to, fight the, to fight the Third Reich. The Soviets withdrew from Afghanistan in 1989, but some of the Islamic volunteers who were trained in the camps by the CIA continued their fight around the world. In 1995, veterans of the Afghan holy war bombed an American-run military training center in Saudi Arabia. These people, some of these people, just left Afghanistan and God is spread all over important cities of the world. An explosion here, an explosion there, an act of terrorism here, an act of terrorism there. And then what was in the media or whose name was in the media very much? Afghanistan. The blowback from Afghanistan led to the first major international terrorist attack on American soil, the bombing of the World Trade Center. The terrorist spiritual leader was Sheikh Abdel Rahman. His fiery rhetoric had inspired many young men in the CIA training camps. Another holy warrior, Ramzi Youssef, allegedly planned to blow up the United Nations and the Holland and Lincoln tunnels. Today, Americans, like many people around the world, worry whether the blowback from the Afghan Jihad will strike again. For more than 40 years, the CIA helped the Guatemalan military fight a savage war against its own people. I saw the head of, um, of a body cut off, and it was just, you know, lying, uh, lying on the grass, and the rest of the body mutilated. 100,000 civilians were killed, and 50,000 others disappeared, many buried in secret mass graves. It started in 1954, when the CIA engineered a coup against the country's democratically elected leader, Jacobo Arbenz. Arbenz had instituted a reform program to give land to the peasants. 
His plan alarmed the country's biggest landowner, the American-owned United Fruit Company. President Eisenhower sent in the CIA. We stepped in and, and tore the place apart since that operation. There have been one, one dictator after another, one, one uh, evil uh, operator after another. It's never been good uh, since that operation. This is the first time in the history of the world that the communist government has been overthrown by the people. It was called Operation Success. A foreign government was secretly overthrown to further the interests of the United States. Guatemala is going to enter a new era in which... But the outcome set the stage for decades of unintended consequences. The generals labeled any opposition as communist subversion. Protests by Mayan Indians, students, labor organizers, and clergy were crushed. Guerrilla rebels began to fight back in a long civil war. The CIA helped create and build the feared Guatemalan military intelligence, called G2. We got technological equipment from CIA, like listening devices, computers, technical equipment, and then we have bigger facilities. And then we had increased personnel, and then they focus against groups that are against the government. The death squads which spread across Latin America were born in Guatemala in the early 60s and continued for the next three decades. People began to vanish. They were simply snatched off the street by armed men in white vans, which became known as Mano Blanco, the White Hand. The victims, who were never seen again, were called the Disappeared. Yeah, that, that squad is an internal policy of Guatemala. But they are financed. I mean, the, the ex, you know, the weapons and all the training comes from the CIA. And uh, I think they have knowledge that they have to use those kind of policies in Guatemala in order to keep control of the territory. G2 set up a network of torture centers and clandestine body dumps throughout Guatemala. I saw techniques of torture. One is a hood that they put a plastic bag uh, in your in your head and they put you facing to the floor and when you are asphyxiating they trying to to cut the the plastic bag with their teeth doing like, like that until they kill them killing in the name of anti-communism became state policy in Guatemala The scourged earth policy is against the Guatemalan people, especially the Mayan people, where the water was poisoned. And when people drank that, they died, where the, uh, the corn and beans and the crops were burned down, where um, <clears throat> women were, were raped massively, where families were shut closed into the house and they were burned alive. Working out of the U.S. Embassy, CIA secret warriors advised and paid some of the top Guatemalan officials who ran the scorched earth policy. Key Guatemalan commanders were trained in counterinsurgency techniques at the School of the Americas in Fort Benning, Georgia. The school was set up to professionalize Latin American military leaders, but some officers were trained with manuals that condoned torture and execution. The school was where the CIA recruited assets from the security forces of Latin America. In the 1960s, Philip Agee's work with some of these security services turned him against the agency. He quit the CIA to become one of its most controversial critics. What the CIA has done is be in intimate uh, contact with and giving money and training and support of all kinds to the security services in Latin America. The school's graduates include Colonel Julio Roberto Alperez, one of Guatemala's G2 leaders, Panama's General Manuel Noriega, a convicted drug trafficker, and Roberto Dobison, who led the death squads in El Salvador. They give them training, they give them guidance, they give them information, and all of this um, is for political stability. In other words, it helps the services repress their own people, including murder on a huge scale, as in Guatemala. Guatemala's long civil war went largely unnoticed in the United States. 
This is the man whom my torturers refer to as their boss. In 1989, Sister Diana Ortiz, an American nun serving in Guatemala, was kidnapped, repeatedly raped, burned with cigarettes, and lowered into a pit of corpses and rats. As my torturers were beginning to rape me again, I became aware of the presence of someone else in the room. I have been asked by the committee to come here and bear witness to facts surrounding the death of my husband. The next year, 1990, an American named Michael Devine disappeared from the inn he ran with his wife in the northern Guatemalan rainforest. The next day, his body was found near the inn with his head nearly severed. Colonel Julio Roberto Alperez was implicated in the murder. He had graduated from the School of the Americas and was still on the CIA's payroll. Colonel Alperez was also suspected in the capture, torture, and execution of Guatemalan guerrilla leader Efrain Bamaka Velazquez. Bamaka's wife was an American lawyer and human rights activist, Jennifer Harbury. Attracting media attention through a long hunger strike, Harbury demanded that the Guatemalan and U.S. governments tell what they knew about her husband's disappearance. She accused the CIA of a cover-up. There was an order of execution by Colonel Julio Alperez in 1992. He was on CIA payroll. Press reports and congressional hearings forced the administration to conduct an internal investigation into the growing scandal. The United States owes the American people a thorough investigation of the allegations of what went on. The Guatemala scandal forced the CIA to admit what many of its critics had alleged for years, that it worked closely with foreign agents involved in murder, kidnappings, and torture. I report to you today that we have taken a great many actions to restore the effectiveness and credibility of the DO. In 1995, CIA Director John Deutsch severely disciplined a dozen officers for shielding unsavory agents and stifling reports of human rights abuses in Guatemala. We have emphasized the need to evaluate the human rights and criminal records of prospective agents. In a move that angered some in the Brotherhood, Director Deutsch fired the two highest ranking CIA officers responsible for operations in Guatemala. I am a little at a loss to understand why it is that we have to take this question of our interpretation of human rights overseas to be sure that some agent that we can use in some connection who has been a murderer or has done something in drugs or what have you, that we shouldn't use him because that means that we'd be violating the better nature of the U.S. public. If you undermine the basic values of our country in the name of defending them, what have you got left? Pretty soon you believe all of this. The trouble with the CIA over the last 16 years has been that they have not been able to understand that there are rules that this country wants followed because they're fundamental to our way of life. In December 1996, the era which began with the CIA's 1954 coup in Guatemala finally came to a close. The last and longest civil war in Central America ended with a peace treaty between the government and guerrilla leaders. A general amnesty was included in the agreement. For many Guatemalans, and the Americans caught in the crossfire, the human cost will never be forgotten. This picture was taken just a few days before he died. This is not some abstraction or some committee footnote that you're dealing with. A good man died and the truth must be pursued. America's war on drugs has turned into a national nightmare. The CIA has recently been enlisted to fight the global drug trade. At the same time, however, critics have charged that the agency contributed to the present drug crisis. The United States government turned their head and let this cocaine come into the United States of America. We are sick and tired of your excuses. Accusations that the CIA started the crack epidemic were set off by a San Jose Mercury news report that appeared in the summer of 1996. 
the front page series claimed that supporters of the CIA-backed Contras sold cheap cocaine to L.A. street gangs to help finance the war in Central America. It is an appalling charge. It is an appalling charge that goes to the heart of this country. The CIA denied the Mercury News charges, which were also discredited in the media. However, for years, various reports have linked CIA covert operations to foreign drug traffickers. There's never a time in all these years that the CIA is not involved with drug traffickers, because the drug traffickers so often are the security forces whose purpose is to er eradicate the drug trade, but who become traffickers themselves. It started right at the beginning of the Cold War, when the CIA helped Corsican gangsters keep the French communists from taking control of the port of Marseille. For the next 25 years, the Corsican mob used the port to ship heroin to America. The blowback was called the French Connection. The best people to work with are criminals. And the reason is they know how to evade the law locally. They have the networks, the hideouts. They know who in the government is corrupt. They probably have already bought the police. They're perfect natural allies. In the 1960s, as the CIA expanded its covert operations to the war zones of Southeast Asia, it recruited tribal leaders who used the agency alliance to become drug lords. Opium and the transfer and the trafficking goes with the title of Commander General. Tony Poe trained Hmong tribesmen to fight the CIA's secret war in Laos. He also tried to keep their opium crop off the market. We tried to work a deal several times to buy the product and to isolate it at the source of a purchase okay, or destroy it. But it didn't work because they increased the production of the goddamn shit. By the late 1960s, the CIA's various covert action partners were transporting heroin from the Golden Triangle to sell to GIs in Vietnam. A presidential report concluded that by 1971, more than a third of the U.S. troops in Vietnam were using heroin. Thousands of troops in Vietnam and thousands of discharged veterans are heroin addicts. A 1972 internal CIA report stated, the past involvement of many of these Laotian officers in drugs is well known. The war has clearly been our overriding priority in Southeast Asia. It would be foolish to deny this and we see no reason to do so. A decade later in Afghanistan, once again the agency found itself backing opium-growing rebels. There were different commanders with different views. We worked very hard to associate ourselves with those who were not involved in the drug trade. But it would be foolish to say that we didn't know there were others that were. <laughs> to support the Afghan resistance against the Soviet occupation, the CIA worked with Afghan rebels, who used the agency's arms, logistics, and support to become the region's largest drug lords. This area has become the leading source of heroin for America and Europe. During the 1980s in Latin America, the CIA's Cold War mission again collided with America's drug war. We have more drugs today in the U.S. than we did 10 years ago. Why? Yet we spend billions of dollars in source countries like Colombia and Peru, Guatemala, Salvador, and we don't even make a dent. DEA agents in Central America had different objectives than CIA officers, who were there to counter communist subversion, not narcotics. That's where the conflict between DEA and the case officer comes about. The case officer may have a neat penetration of a drug cartel, DEA's coming at it from a different angle. They want that guy because they want him to go down. They want that caller. The CIA guy wants to maintain him there to continue to furnish data. One of the CIA's informants who exploited his long relationship with the agency was Panama's General Manuel Noriega. A few months before I got to the CIA, when Noriega was on the CIA's payroll, I felt this was not a man 
the United States should be associated with. And during the entire Carter years, he was not on the U.S. payroll, not once. As soon as we left, he went back on the payroll. In 1981, when William Casey succeeded Stansfield Turner, stopping the Sandinista revolution in Nicaragua became the overriding priority in Central America. Noriega offered his assistance, and the CIA started working with him again, despite allegations of his criminal activities. Let's put it this way. Noriega probably wasn't a very nice man. He may have either killed people or been involved in people being killed. He may have been in the drug business, may not have been in the drug business. He may have been in the laundry business, money laundering business, or may not have been. I don't know. As long as Noriega supported the Contra War, the CIA and the Reagan-Bush administration overlooked his illegal enterprises. When the Contra War ended, Noriega's drug ties became a growing embarrassment for the CIA and for President Bush. The agency tried to instigate a coup against the dictator, but it was unsuccessful. We had people like Noriega, who we knew was heavily involved in narcotics trafficking, in money and laundering, but he was playing ball with us. He was giving us intelligence on the Cubans. Vice versa, he was giving the Cubans intelligence on us. When he refused to play ball with us, we took him out. The United States invaded Panama, and Noriega was extradited in the costliest drug bust in history. The general, who was eventually convicted and imprisoned on drug trafficking charges, was not the only CIA operative in Central America involved in the narcotics trade. During the 1980s, when the CIA was building the Contra Army, it needed people who knew how to move money and guns to Central America. Blowback struck when some of these operatives used the Contra supply network to fly illegal drugs north to the United States. I, we had gathered intelligence that the Contras were heavily involved in narcotics trafficking. Hangars 4 and 5 at El Opango Airport in Salvador were owned and operated by the CIA. Our surveillance and our informants uh, revealed that they were heavily involved in narcotics trafficking. And uh, the informant was the guy who did the flight plans for all the Contra pilots, and it turned out that some of those pilots were documented in, in DEA files as narcotics traffickers. In 1986, Senator John Kerry began investigating allegations of links between the CIA-backed Contras and drug traffickers. Are you aware of whether or not narcotics proceeds at some time may or may not have supported Contra efforts? Yes, sir. Narcotics proceeds were used to shore up the uh, Contra effort. Did you personally play a role in some of the transfer of that money? Yes, I did. In the course of the Contra War, the United States, as a matter of policy, abandoned drug law enforcement, looked the other way at the kinds of uh, conditions where we were creating that enhanced the ability of traffickers to move dope into the United States, and in effect allowed a drug trade to flourish, all to support the Contra movement and to support the war. Was any of the money traceable? to drugs or to drug-related transactions? The money that we, uh, you're talking about the money that we provided? That's right. No, sir. And why was that? Because we we're experts at what we do. We permitted narcotics. I mean, we were complicitous as a country in narcotics traffic at the same time as we're spending countless dollars in this country to try to get rid of this problem as law enforcement officials risk their lives, how can you ask a DEA agent to go out there, risk their life, when there's a whole other policy out here that is willing to overlook narcotics? It's mind-boggling. The findings of the Kerry subcommittee did not receive much public attention. However, almost a decade later, the same questions are being asked. This lady here. Thank you so much for Mr. CIA official for being here, but I would just like to ask you how are we supposed to trust the CIA official to investigate themselves? I mean, we, we are having a problem with that. I did not expect to come here and find everybody applauding the remarks that I made. But I want you to know I've come here and told you, unlike the other cases that you've mentioned, 
where there was nobody who came here and told you. There was no director of central intelligence who came out and told you there's going to be an investigation. That's something. The fact that there has been such outrage in Los Angeles, in the black community across the country, in other communities across the country, is a very telling blow to the CIA. What it says is the CIA has no residual support and goodwill in this country. In the fall of 1996, CIA Director John Deutsch visited a town hall meeting in South Central Los Angeles to answer the community's questions about the CIA crack stories. With a better appreciation of what's on your mind, and I go away with a conviction that we're going to do more to stop drugs from coming into the United States. Thank you very much. When people will shout the director down in Los Angeles, it doesn't have a good reputation. They cannot sustain the CIA without public support. No governmental institution will survive in this country without the support of the citizens, not of the Congress, not of the president, of the citizens. The CIA and the Congressional Black Caucus have each promised a complete investigation into the recent drug allegations. While Americans await the outcome of these inquiries, many still suspect that the public war on drugs has been undermined by the CIA's secret warriors. At age 50, the Central Intelligence Agency is struggling to cope with the blowback from its past Cold War operations. Its record of tragedies and scandals has left the future of the Secret Warriors up for debate. Well, the biggest problem is that there's no enemy. And until somebody can sit down and define a mission for the CIA, they've got a problem. I mean, to say that the director of operations don't know what to do now that the Cold War's over is nonsense. Proliferation of, of nuclear weapons, of biological, chemical in their delivery systems is perhaps more dangerous to the world today in the United States than it was at, when the Soviet Union was around. Have you thought of saying we won and redoing the whole concept, maybe getting rid of it? That's what we did after World War I. And then we found we'd made a mistake. We did it again after World War II. We disbanded our OSS. And then we found we'd made a mistake. Let's not go through that process again. If you want to terrorize the world, you need the CIA. But if you want to let the, the hopes and aspirations of the people develop normally, then you must destroy the CIA. I have tremendous respect for the people in the Directorate of Operations at the CIA. But it's very unfortunate that repeatedly over the last 16 years, this operation has violated the laws of the United States of America. The laws. All over Latin America, and all over the third world for that matter, there is a, a huge segment of have-nots in the populations. And as long as you have injustice like that, you will have people who resist. And that is why the CIA, in my estimate, still has to be used as a tool to intervene clandestinely in the affairs of other countries in order to do just what I was doing in the 60s. The important part of covert action is that it has changed from the past. It's not overthrowing governments here and there. It's tailored to the real threats that we and others in the peace-loving world face from drugs, from terrorism, from uh, those who want to spread around weapons of mass destruction. There are threats. There are bad people out there who do bad things. Uh, and it might sound trite, but there's enough badness out there that good officers in our service have got a lot of work to do. We are in an information revolution that no longer requires the kind of CIA that we used to have. Because frankly, I can get it faster and cheaper off the internet than the CIA can get it for me. Swashbuckle is, is kind of over. And to say, why would I join the CIA today, for what? What would draw me to, to do that? 
to go steal the, the uh, ceramic engine from Mitsubishi to give it some bozo in General Motors? Uh, I, I mean, to, to do what? This organization ought to be smaller, more highly focused, and focused on just the tough targets. And by the tough targets, they mean the almost impossible targets. Now, how are you going to motivate people at this stage in our society with the Cold War over? I don't know. There's going to have to be something awful happen, like a nuclear device go off, or, you know, a reservoir gets poisoned, or a biological a weapon goes off, or some awful thing happens. And then when they look back on it and say, well, how the Christ did this happen? Well, because you have a Directorate of Operations, which is the Postal Department. They started as a secret brotherhood and ended as a government bureaucracy. Now the mission is unclear and the myth is gone. Today, the CIA's greatest mission may be saving itself. There are those who believe it is a mission impossible.